Dark Cast Network. The light shines brightest on our indie podcasts. Two suspects are being one case involves the DCF now to see for the police are releasing marathon. Welcome to Misty Mysteries. I'm your host, Keely. This is a True Crime and Paranormal podcast, and it is spooky season, which means a spooky season collab. This collab is with the host of Beyond the Rainbow and founder of the Dark Cast Network, CJ. I'm so glad to have put this episode together for you. Today, CJ is going to be talking you through the case of the Cleveland Torso Killer, and I will be talking you through the haunting of it. So let's dive right in. Hey there, Rainbow Warriors. I'm CJ, host of Beyond the Rainbow, true crimes of the LGBT. My episodes focus on crimes committed by and against the LGBTQ community. I've covered cases you probably have heard of, such as Matthew Shepard, Brandon Tina, and the Orlando Pulse nightclub massacre, as well as some lesser known cases like the murder of Ray Hainish, the Australian gay beat murders, and the suspicious disappearance of Lisa Lynn Stone. I cover cases brought to me by listeners like Penny Brummer, who I believe was wrongfully convicted, taboo cases such as lesbian corrective rape and murder in South Africa, and Pray the Gay Away camps. I discuss gay serial killers, women who pretend to be men to hook up with other women, and trans murders. I'm opinionated and uncensored, I know I'm not everyone's cup of tea, but surely I'm someone shot at tequila. No matter what your gender or orientation in life might be, please join me as I tackle rainbow crimes in search of unicorn justice. Remember, it's not a crime to be gay, unless you're a murderer. The city of Cleveland, Ohio, sits in all its glory on the banks of Lake Erie. While the city boasts some great museums, including the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, there are also some very notorious crimes that have come from this location. Serial killer Michael Madison went on trial in 2016. He killed at least three women in 2013. Their bodies were discovered in his apartment. He received the death penalty. In 2009, police discovered 11 bodies belonging to women in Anthony Sowell's house. In 2011, Anthony was convicted of all the murders and he was sentenced to death. In 2013, police dispatch received a call from one of three women who had been abducted and held hostage for nearly a decade. The three women suffered from major mental trauma but all three were found alive in the home of a man named Ariel Castro. A month after his arrest, Ariel was found hanging in his cell by a bedsheet. As you can see, Cleveland might be lovely, but it does have a checkered past. Starting back during the Great Depression, which really wasn't so great at all, there was another serial killer on the loose. This killer operated for the better part of four years in the Cleveland area completely baffling police. I should probably warn you now, the case of the Cleveland Torso Killer has never been solved. We will not find closure in this case. It's assumed that the killer was male, and I think we'll go with that. He was possibly a transient who rode the rails into the new station in Cleveland in the early 30s. He was also possibly struggling with his sexual identity The killer preyed on both men and women. The official count of murders by this killer was 12. Although the killer might be responsible for as many as 20 people in Cleveland, Youngstown, Ohio, and Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. In Cleveland, he operated in the downtrodden Kingsbury Run area. This area was known for homelessness and vulnerable people. I would think that this killer might have a medical background, seeing how they enjoyed cutting up their victims. The first possible victim of the torso killer was said to be a woman whose decomposing body was found by a man walking along the edge of Lake Erie in September 1934. However, it was not a full body that was found, only a partial torso with thighs attached. She appeared to be in her 30s. On the portion that was found of the body, 
a chemical substance had been poured onto it, causing her skin to become red and leathery. This woman's remains are only known as the Lady of the Lake, and her true identity was never discovered. In November of 1934, a homeless man named Emil Frognick was offered food by a doctor. Uh-huh, see? Emil took the food, he ate it, and immediately he felt sick. He hopped the boxcar of a train and he woke up three days later believing the doctor had drugged him. That's a little suspicious, I think. In September of 1935, Edward Andrasi's body was found by two teenagers climbing a bank of Lake Erie. The man's body was naked except for socks. He'd been decapitated and his penis removed. He had rope burns on his wrists, and his body had been drained of blood. 28-year-old Edward was a handsome, bisexual man. His remains had also been doused with a chemical causing his skin to be red and leathery. When the teens reported their discovery to the police, the police found yet another man's body nearby. He was also decapitated, castrated, and had the chemical poured on his remaining skin, turning it red and leathery. This man was referred to as John Doe No. 1. The medical examiner was able to determine that the man was white and about 42 years of age. Florence Pulillo was found in January the following year. The 44-year-old had been decapitated, and most of her body was found in downtown Cleveland. Her body parts were found all over the place. Some were even wrapped in burlap and put into a basket. This basket was found by employees of an unsuspecting business. She was identified by her fingerprints of her right hand that was found. On June 5, 1936, John Doe II was discovered. He was also dubbed the Tattoo Man, and that makes me want to research when the first tattoos occurred. I had no idea they had such a thing back then. His head was found wrapped in a pair of pants, and his body was found near the police station the following day. One thing authorities did with this victim was to make a death mask, or a replica of the victim's face using wax or plaster post-mortem. That mask is then shown to the public to see if an identity of the victim can come to light. Sadly, no one was able to identify John Doe No. 2. So far, police believed all of the victims had been murdered elsewhere and dumped right where they were found. On July 22, 1936, another victim was found. This time, the police believed that the victim was murdered right there on the spot where they found him, due to a large amount of blood they found with the body. This victim, John Doe No. 3. He was found naked and decapitated. I think it's kind of odd how the male victims so far have all been found naked. A few months later in September, John Doe No. 4 was found near a pond. He was severed into two pieces and his penis had been cut off. In February the following year, Jane Doe No. 2 had been found in the same location as the Lady of the Lake. She'd been decapitated and her head was never found. Rose Wallace was tentatively identified as the victim of the torso killer, although the coroner never agreed with the identification. Mrs. Wallace's gold dental work was identified by a young black man in April of 1938. This young man claimed to be Rose's son. No positive identification of this victim has ever really been made. However, to this date, the victim is considered to be Rose Wallace, the only black victim of the torso killer. Half of John Doe No. 5's body was found floating in the Cuyahoga River. His head was never found, and his heart had been removed. Jane Doe No. 3 was found floating headless in the Cuyahoga River also. She was the only victim found that had drugs in her system. Jane Doe No. 4 happened four months later in August, when her headless body was found in a city dump. John Doe No. 6 was found in the same city dump, and also headless. But this John Doe's head was found nearby in a can. 
At the beginning of these killings, a new lawman was brought into Cleveland to help solve the cases. This lawman was instrumental in bringing down the mobster Al Capone in Chicago. The lawman was part of a group called the Untouchables. His name, Elliot Ness. Elliot, who was usually very successful in catching perpetrators, was frustrated. And at the end of 1938, which coincidentally was pretty much the end of the killings, he had Kingsbury run in the homeless encampments inspected for clues. When nothing was found, he had the place burned. This displaced about 300 already displaced homeless people. But after the raid and fire, the killing stopped. Coincidence? Maybe. A short handful of suspects were looked at. An immigrant bricklayer named Frank Dolzal somehow earned a spot on the suspect list. He was brought to the police station for questioning, and he confessed. He was given three different scenarios, and he confessed to all of them. But then... Frank retracted his confessions. He had absolutely no idea or details about the crime he was being accused of. While being held in a jail cell, Frank took his own life. It wasn't until decades later that his name was finally cleared from being the torso killer. His suicide was also ruled as a homicide. He had broken ribs and he didn't have those before his arrest. Most likely, his confessions were coerced with police brutality. Incidentally, Frank Dolzal was the only person ever arrested for being the serial killer. Another Frank was also being looked at, and my money's on him being the Cleveland torso killer. His name, Dr. Frank Sweeney. This Frank had a rough childhood. His mom died from a stroke when he was only nine years old and his father was badly injured in an accident, and this caused Frank and his siblings to struggle for food and rent to survive. Frank enlisted in the military, and he fought in World War I, but he was discharged after suffering from a major head trauma in France. But Frank was still determined to be successful. He worked hard to get himself through pharmacy and medical school. He was intelligent, and he was completely absorbed in science and medicine. He ended up marrying a Slavic woman, and they had two children. Frank, by now, was an expert surgical resident. He did have a tendency to overwork himself and get stressed easily, and this led to alcoholism as a coping mechanism. He was admitted to the city hospital for substance abuse, but the program he was in just didn't work. He continued to drink when he was released. Frank also had some psychosis that was genetic. His drinking combined with his mental health issues rendered Frank physically violent, and he'd expressed that violence towards his wife and children. The attacks on his wife and children prompted his wife to leave, taking the kids and filing for divorce. Frank's world started to crumble down around him, and it was all happening about the same time that the first body, the Lady of the Lake, was found. It would seem that Dr. Frank was also born and raised in the Kingsbury Run area, just on the outskirts, and he knew the area extremely well. It's also been rumored that Dr. Frank was gay. As I said before, Dr. Frank Sweeney is seriously my bet as the Cleveland torso killer. He had a tragic childhood. He suffered a brain injury. He had mental health issues. And he self-medicated with alcohol. His sexuality was most likely gay or bi. He may have been struggling to accept that as well. And emotionally, he started crashing right about the same time the killings began. Police did bring Dr. Frank in for questioning, and he even failed a lie detector test, but they didn't pursue him any further. Way to go, Elliot Ness! Now here's Keeley from Misty Mysteries to talk about the paranormal aspect of these crimes. 
Now let's dive into the haunting of the Kingsbury Run Mad Butcher, also known as the Cleveland Torso Killer. And since it is unknown who the killer is to this day, no haunting can be linked to the killer exactly. Instead, the haunting link to this true crime case is linked to one particular place, a roadhouse and railroad station in Cleveland known as the Midway Railway Preservation Society today. This roadhouse was built as the Cleveland Valley and Terminal Railroad in 1907. At this time, it ran about 24-7 and with around 400 employees, it was made to service 15 local motives. But eventually, this once very busy roadhouse was abandoned as the railroad industry changed. Fast forward to today, it is being restored by the Midway Railway Preservation Society, although it is mainly used for trains and the history of the railroad We can't deny the tragic events that have happened on these tracks and with the train cars there today, making this roadhouse home for many spirits who haunt it. One of the most famous train cars on site, for not only its history but its haunting, is a train car called the Death Car. On August 30th, 1947, an accident happened on the tracks in Lackawanna, New York. That took the lives of 27 people riding in the car and injured 114. Even with this tragic event, the death car remained in good shape and would be used in the movie The Natural in 1984, and it now sits at the Preservation Society housing the spirits of those who lost their lives in that accident. These spirits are seen quite often on tours of the death car. One of my favorite stories of these hauntings takes place in the car while a tour group was in there. The tour guide was telling the group about the history of the death car when one of the women in the group stopped the guide and asked him if he was going to let the man behind him talk since he was in character. There was definitely no man behind the guide and no man on site that was dressed in character that day. This spirit is not only seen by guests wearing a tweed suit standing behind the guides, but he is sometimes seen in the group or behind the group. Volunteers, employees, and investigators will also see this man from the outside of the car sitting by the windows. A haunting mostly experienced by the volunteers, employees, and paranormal investigators at the railway is the unexplained noises in the death car and the windows slamming shut. The unexplained noises that most explain as metal clinking is heard from both inside and outside of the car. For one of the scariest, inside of the car happens when you open the window. Years back, the crew of the show Ghost Hunters was invited to the railroad, and they spoke to one of the employees who on numerous occasions, after opening all the windows in the death car, experienced every window slamming shut at the same time. Later on in their investigation, while investigating the car, they opened the window to only have it closed right after. If you never watch Ghost Hunters, the team is full of professionals in other fields, and they often try to debunk what they experience. When the window slammed shut on them, they were able to determine that the windows are pretty sensitive and closed by themselves with many movements. Do you think that debunks them all closing at the same time, though? Because I'm not too sure. Now, for the last spirit seen in the death car is one, or maybe many, that has been seen all over the track. These spirits are seen sitting on top of the train cars with their legs hanging down. It's believed that these could be the spirits of the many brakemen who lost their lives on the job. The brakemen would ride on the outside of the train, often on top of them. Their jobs were to operate the brakes for the train, which for a long time sat outside of the cars. This is a very dangerous job, and many of these employees unfortunately fell off the trains to their deaths. But the railroad industry was not a safe job, and the brakeman was not the only dangerous job on the tracks. Inside the roadhouse, there was one man who suffocated from the smog and the smoke of the work that had to be done to keep these trains operational. 
This man, along with many other workers, may still be in the roadhouse, haunting the building with the sound of banging metal that is heard throughout the building. Let's go in a full circle to the Kingsbury Mad Butcher, which is why we're here today. Some of his victims were dumped near these tracks in the roadhouse, which leads many to believe his victims, if not the possible residual energy of them, may haunt the building in the tracks closest to where they were left after their lives were forcefully taken from them. Preservation Society actually wonders if the killer worked at the roadhouse based on how familiar he was with the tracks and with 400 employees at the time that he was active, it would be hard to pinpoint who it could be. If the killer worked at the roadhouse, it could also play a factor into why his victims may haunt this location. The hauntings attributed to the victims of the Mad Butcher have him both inside the roadhouse and outside of it on the tracks and the train cars. The voices of what could possibly be his victims are heard. Unexplained noises can be heard and spirits, including shadow figures, can be seen walking in the building. Outside of the tracks, tapping is heard on the tracks. Unexplained banging or noises can be heard. In the train cars, just like in the death car, the windows will shut on their own when no one is in the cars. The train car doors will open and close on their own. Spirits are seen walking on the tracks and in the cars. They are also seen sitting by the windows of the cars and sleeping in the beds. These may not be the scariest hauntings, but this place is full of history, including being the dumping grounds for one of the most notorious unsolved serial killers. If you want to try to experience any of these hauntings yourself or find yourself in Cleveland with nothing to do on a Saturday, you can take a tour of the place from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. for just $5. Thank you so much for listening. I really hope you enjoyed this episode. Please send CJ some love. Head over to her and listen to all the true crime spooky content she has. Please stay spooky out there. Stay safe this season. Stay warm. And I will see you next week.